Hello. Um, so as Boris said, I am Jeremy, and thank you for coming to my talk. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, Lille is just such a wonderful city, and I regret that I have to leave right away tomorrow, but I'll enjoy it while I'm here. So um, as Boris said, I'm currently a web performance consultant for Site Improve, based not too far from here, out uh, in Copenhagen. And my job is to help our customers figure out what, what they can do with or without our tools to help make their sites faster. Um, and so this talk is based on a series of articles for a list apart called Responsible JavaScript, which is a sort of collection of ideas and techniques about getting your project's JavaScript under control. So if you like this talk, uh, you might like these articles. Links to resources will be in the slide deck, uh, which I'll post to notice later on. Uh, as soon as I get a stable connection. Uh, good thing I'm talking about this at a web performance conference. <laughs> um, so to start, I would like to talk about a word that I stumbled on uh, years ago, and that word is spectiousness, um, which is an unusual word. It's not one you see all the time, uh, but it has some relevance to our work. And to be spectious means to exhibit deterministic and pre-programmed behaviors, kind of like a machine. And the root of the word sphex is actually a name for a genus of solitary wasps. Um, I promise you that this is not an entomology talk. <laughs> These wasps don't just act in a pre-programmed fashion. They can also be very easily manipulated. And so the way that it kind of works is that these wasps provision larvae with paralyzed crickets. And when they bring prey back to the nest, they begin this sort of routine. Before dragging the cricket back into the nest, the wasp will leave it outside and then inspect the nest. And this behavior seems thoughtful, but it really isn't. Uh, because if an observer moves the cricket before the wasp reemerges, it will come back out uh, and set the cricket back to where it was before inspecting the nest again. And this cycle can go on endlessly. You can repeat this endlessly with the wasp, and they'll never catch on. It's just sort of this pre-programmed, determined behavior. Now, I didn't come all the way to France in your wonderful country <laughs> to be a big jerk and imply that you're all mindless. Uh, we're, as developers, we are not mindless. We, we want to have thoughtful solutions for the things that we do. Uh, yet, there are some decisions involved in our work that we tend to make without question. We tend to do them almost automatically. Uh, for example, when we begin a new project, we open a terminal and we install a familiar framework, and then possibly a client-side router for the framework, and then possibly a state management library for the framework, of course. And all the while, we're unaware of or perhaps have even made peace with the overhead that these, that these conveniences bring. And this matters because the amount of JavaScript we serve has steadily increased over the years to the point where it has become a major performance concern. Half the sites you visit will send around 370 kilobytes or less of JavaScript. The 75th percentile sends at least 650K, and the 90th percentile sends at least one megabyte of JavaScript. These graphs are generated from the HTTP archive, which, among other things, tracks the transfer size of JavaScript, which is often compressed. And while compression is essential to loading performance, it doesn't change the fact that when a megabyte of compressed JavaScript is downloaded, it decompresses to a significantly larger amount of JavaScript that must parse, compile, and execute. Now, if you're using a high-end device on a fast network, you probably won't feel how just excruciatingly slow this can be. But on less capable hardware, such as this very affordable but much slower Moto G4 Android phone, chewing through tons of JavaScript is just an awful kind of slog. And that's worth paying attention to, because when devices, networks, or both are slow, the web becomes more difficult for people to use. So at the bottom of this web page test timeline is the main thread activity indicator. And when it's green, the browser has, has breathing room to take on more work if need be. Uh, but when it's red, the browser can't really do anything else until it's done with whatever is occupying the main thread. 
As you can see here, it's completely occupied for like two, four, sometimes even six seconds at a time where the user is blocked from doing anything. Now, if you pair that with a slow network, you can imagine how tiresome the web becomes to use for many people. And in that spirit, understanding constraints is key to writing good software. The best video games ever made were about a megabyte, sometimes far less than that. Um, game developers of the time understood that, well, they, they not only had vision, but they also understood the constraints on their work. But their constraints were fixed to the hardware that they produced games for. If you, had, if you were making a Super Nintendo game, you effectively had one type of hardware that you knew everybody had that you were developing for. Our constraints are not fixed. They change significantly from person to person. And in some ways, that makes our job much more difficult than theirs. But that doesn't mean that we can't make great experiences on the web that work for everyone everywhere. So let's talk about how we can turn that specciousness into anti-specciousness for the good of the web and for all who use it. There's a phrase I came across recently. It goes something like, paint the picture, not the frame. And it comes from an article by Eric Bailey about accessibility and UX. Uh, somebody who you should definitely uh, check out, uh, his website it has a lot of great stuff. He writes all the time on accessibility. It's wonderful writing. Um, and this phrase is a clever way of saying we shouldn't reinvent things that the browser already does very well. Eric advises us that we should not subvert a person's expectations by changing externally consistent behaviors. Examples of external, consist external consistency might be the default behaviors of HTML elements or the appearance of a scroll bar even. And when we disrupt this external consistency, we may impede people in unexpected ways. One way we do this is when we fail to use semantic HTML and instead rely on JavaScript to re-implement or approximate those behaviors. And this can result in websites which are harder to use for those who rely on assistive technology. So let's take this example React component, which is a newsletter subscription form. I, I know it's a lot of code on one slide. We'll zoom into each little piece of it as we need to. Um, this component has an input field, a corresponding label, and a submit button all in a single div. And if you can see it, um, which I will zoom in, uh, <laughs> you may have opinions on what's wrong with this code, but what I will tell you is that the solution doesn't require more JavaScript. It requires less of it. So let's dive into the form JSX, or the markup, as it were. So there are three things that are wrong here that probably scream out to you if you're into accessibility. Uh, one. A form isn't a form unless it uses a form tag. Divs are not intrinsically flawed, but they lack semantic meaning by design. Um, and that's just fine for some things. But this is a form. A form should always use a form tag. <laughs> because that has meaning to assistive technologies. And two, when we label inputs, a label element should be used with a for attribute that corresponds to an ID on the input itself. This lets assistive technologies know that a given input has an associated label. And three, while divs can be coded to behave and look like buttons, doing so robs a button of any semantic meaning it would otherwise have if it was just a button element. Plus, a button element's default behavior within a form is to submit that form. This makes it more resilient uh, for when, when, not if, JavaScript fails to run, because JavaScript doesn't always run everywhere. Things happen. So here's the refactored markup, uh, of which every part now has semantic meaning that assistive technologies can use. And assuming the component is server rendered, it will also still work if scripts fail to run and attach to that markup and mount a component. And note that the submit event handler has been moved from the button's on click event to the form's on submit event. This is helpful, helpful for when we want to intercept a form's submit event if we want to, want to enhance this form's behavior with client side scripts later on. Now here's the final component code in its entirety, uh, omitting some of the handle submit stuff. Uh, additionally, because email validation is now handled through HTML, we can remove the email validation script entirely 
Of course, we should always sanitize our inputs on the server. So it's not a, it's not a catch all for everything, but allows you to load less client side script. And any opportunity where you can remove some amount of JavaScript and get things a bit lighter should be a welcome change. And external consistency isn't limited to HTML and CSS and JavaScript. We expect browsers themselves to behave in a predictable fashion. And one of the most common subversions of this predictability is the SPA, or the single page application. I don't hate SPAs, but <laughs> the navigation behavior they replace is one that browsers already do very well. It's, it has been a specified process that has evolved over a long period of time since browsers have been browsers. And it, I think it takes a little bit of hubris to say that we can do better than that entirely on the client side. But when we embrace client side routing, we take on a, new whole, we take on a whole host of, re, of new responsibilities the browser once managed for us. History must be managed, tab index and scrolling position must be accounted for, navigation canceling can fail, and probably a bunch of other weird little edge cases and all of, a lot of nooks and crannies that we tend not to think about all the time. And even if we get client-side routing just, I mean, perfect, performance is affected if that content is not server rendered. And furthermore, if we, set, if we fail to send contentful markup from the server, the page's contents are inaccessible if JavaScript fails, or remember, when it fails because it doesn't always run everywhere every time. And when we rely on standard synchronous navigation behavior, I will concede this, we do lose a bit of that snappiness that we kind of like. Um, but we retain that coveted external consistency. And that's not to say that client-side routers are always bad, bad, filthy, dirty things, but using them requires extra care on your part. For example, you'll need to provide server-side equivalents for all of your client-side routes so people have a way to reliably access any part of your site from any context. Uh, people are not going to just come into your app from the same place all the time, depending on what your app is. They might click in from Google. Uh, well, in this case, it wouldn't even be indexed, so they're not even going to be able to find it on Google. But then, if components are attached to server-side markup through client-side hydration, people get a progressively enhanced experience where they'll get the nice and shiny and the really convenient things if they can actually use them. And if you want to avoid SPAs, but still want to do something to make navigations just a little bit snappier, link prefetching may be the, the thing for you. It can seriously boost loading performance and navigation performance by fetching page HTML in advance of a user, use, uh, of a user requesting it. It's not perfect. Uh, it could potentially waste data if it's not done carefully. You have to think about these things. Uh, but to address these potential shortcomings, the Google Chrome team offers a very small link prefetching script, which will only prefetch links in the, as they appear in the viewport when the main thread is idle and if the network isn't slow, and it uses this data from the Network Information API. Now, I know I'm prattling on about all the free stuff that the browser gives us, but the point remains. The browser gives us a lot for free. So let's just use that free stuff whenever possible so we can focus instead on the more challenging problems of web development. Another tenant of my responsible JavaScript philosophy consists of a fundamental truth. And that is that the tools are not infallible. A hammer can help you build something or it can break your fingers. Understanding how the tools work is, part of, is a big part of creating fast and accessible websites. And one tool many of us use when we need the JavaScript we write to work everywhere is Babel. Babel is valuable. It's, it's indispensable in many cases even, but we tend not to see how it can harm performance if we don't peek under the hood to see what's going on. We would all benefit if we could transpile less because the way Babel transforms our code can add a lot to our production scripts um, when they're deployed. And it helps to know how Babel transforms the code we write so we can compensate for its inefficiencies if we need to. So here's an example. We have a console logger function uh, it's a pretty spare example, but I think it will illustrate my point. Uh, and this wrapper function accepts a message and level parameter. Uh, and really it just accesses the console, um, the console methods and provides a message. The second parameter is the log level with a default of log. Looks harmless, right? And they're really convenient little things. 
Um, but default parameters are nice, but Babel transforms them inefficiently and repeats that inefficient transform every time default parameters are used. And so you think every time you use this, you're just adding a little bit more, a little bit more every time. And if we can't avoid Babel altogether, and sometimes we can't, JSX is a thing and it has to be transpiled, uh, we should try to compensate for some of this stuff. We can avoid this specific transform, and there are many transforms that Babel provides, by replacing the default parameter with an or check. When we want to assign a default to an optional parameter, we, check, we do a check where the left side of the or is the parameter itself as it is passed in, and the right side is the default. If the level parameter is omitted in this case, the right side of the or condition is used, and Babel won't touch this. But default parameters are only one feature that Babel transforms. Let's take ES6 classes, for example. They're nice. I, they're great. It's just the right amount of syntactic sugar over the prototype pattern to make it like so it resembles classes as we see them in other languages. But the way Babel transforms them is expensive. Now, if you can't read it, that's fine. That's kind of the point. It's a lot of code that I've had to put on one slide. Uh, you can mitigate this cost in one of a few ways, and how you mitigate it is just going to depend. One, you could use the prototype pattern and avoid ES6 classes altogether. That is, feels kind of yucky <laughs> for some people, especially uh, for somebody like me who really likes the way that ES6 classes work. Uh, two, you could use uh, Babel plugin transform runtime to deduplicate the helpers Babel adds to reduce their impact across an entire project. Uh, or three, if you only need to support modern browsers, you could drop Br Babel altogether. If you can do this, it's your best bet, but you might not always be able to because JSX. <laughs> how we write JavaScript, though, isn't the only thing to consider when using Babel. We also need to know how to configure Babel as well. So here's a Webpack bundle analysis for an example app that I wrote a while back, which uses a Babel config that isn't finely tuned. It sits at about 117 kilobytes, and by, by statistical standards, not a lot of JavaScript, but in this case, most of it is comprised of polyfills. And so polyfilling is something Babel is used a lot for. If you're familiar with Babel preset env, this code may look familiar. However, it's worth taking a second look at this use built-ins option, which uses core.js to polyfill features. And when we set, um, when we set use built-ins to entry, uh, to a value of entry, Core.js itself must be added as an entry point, and that adds more polyfills than we might need, depending on the browser. But if we change the value of use built-ins from entry to usage, we can remove Core.js as an entry point, and Babel will automatically polyfill the features that are actually used by our browser's list query. This can seriously reduce how many polyfills get used. And while we're here, um, there's another config option that we should pay attention to, which toggles something called loose mode. This is when uh, Babel uh, transforms your code so that its output adheres less strictly to the ECMAScript standard. Loose transforms are a bit smaller um, and still work in many cases, and they can be enabled by setting the loose option to true. Loose mode isn't bulletproof, though. Uh, you could have issues if you move from untranspiled, uh, transpiled ES6 to untranspiled ES6 later on. But if the savings are worth it, you can always address this problem if it comes up. And as a side note, you're not always going to be able to remove Babel because, and I, you're probably sensing a theme, because JSX sometimes. <laughs> so after making these two quick configuration changes, we've reduced the size of our bundle by about 52%. And that's a big deal. With half as much code, this app will be faster, will get interactive more quickly, especially for devices with limited processing power and memory. And in addition, a novel way of serving less JavaScript has recently emerged called differential serving, uh, something of a, that's been a bit of a hobby horse of mine this year, um, which involves serving one, or two, one of two bundles to users based on their browser's capabilities. Legacy browsers get bundles with more transforms and polyfills, while modern browsers get smaller bundles with little to none of those things because they natively support language features that Babel is often transforming. The outcome is that an app functions identically in either case, but with substantially less code for those using modern browsers, which is the majority of users, generally speaking. Of course, we need, need a way to load these bundles properly. So what you see here is how we've always loaded JavaScript. 
The pattern shown here is how we can differentially serve scripts. The first script tag loads a bundle for modern browsers. Adding the type equals module uh, attribute ensures that this script gets picked up by modern browsers. The second script element loads a bundle for legacy browsers. No module attribute ensures that modern browsers will decline to download the affected script. Legacy browsers don't understand no module, so they'll just go ahead and download the script anyway. Now, configuring your tool chain to generate these bundles it is involved, but it is doable. First, you need to create two separate Babel configurations, one for legacy bundles and one for modern bundles. This configuration is typical of what you'd see in a lot of projects, uh, which transform code that's compatible kind of just everywhere. It will work in IE 11 or wherever you need it to. Now, this is a configuration for generating bundles for modern browsers. You'll notice that use built-ins is gone, and that in this case, that's because the configuration is for a project which needs no polyfills for modern browsers. But depending on the language features you use, you may need to retain that option, but most of the time, you're probably not going to need it. Instead of a browser's list query, we've, been, we've supplied an option named ES module set to true, which translates to a browser's list query under the hood uh, in Babel for browsers that support ES6 modules. And the thinking is, is that if browsers support ES6 modules, they're also going to support a whole slew of other features like async and await, um, spread syntax, arrow functions, all that stuff. And then we can group these configs together under an ENV object in our Babel config. Client legacy is a config for legacy browsers, while client modern is the config for modern ones. And then in our bundler config, we can point to these separate Babel configs. So in Webpack, um, you can see here, this is a kind of a typical-ish example of, of, uh, of how Babel Loader ensures that scripts get processed by Babel. Note the env name option, which points to a configuration in the env object in the Babel config from the previous slide. And then by creating a separate config and pointing to a client modern Babel config, you can generate a smaller bundle of your code for modern browsers with identical functionality. And I can hear you right now, Jeremy, this is a lot of stuff to do. It's a lot of work. Is it worth it? It depends on your application. The size reduction between these bundles depends. Sometimes you might only get 5 to 10%, but some projects, projects could see a lot more. I've seen in um, some of my consulting work that some repos have like, been able to cut about half as much code. Uh, this is a bundle analysis of an example app's legacy bundle. It's already small at around 68K, but with differential serving, we can go from small to nano and deliver this app to modern browsers in 40% of the size of its legacy counterpart. But be aware, some browsers may have issues with the platform-provided pattern for differentially serving scripts. Think no module, type equals module that I, just, that I talked about a few slides back. If you want to know more about this, uh, in the interest of time, I, I will point you to this article that I wrote, this short little article on my blog that talks about some of the pitfalls and how you can circumvent them uh, with a JavaScript pattern uh, that injects scripts. And finally, this leads us into a discussion about what it means to be accommodating, which I feel is the most important part of this talk. Because when we deploy something to the web, we have to be a steward of that thing. And in the US, many people live in large cities which are typically well served by fast broadband and mobile internet connections. Yet, this article by the MIT Technology Review revealed that 58% of the households in the Cleveland metro area with yearly incomes under $20,000 had no broadband internet access. These are people who rely on mobile internet connections, often with data caps, to access the web. And more striking is this passage in which Pew Research found that one-third of Americans don't have an internet connection in their homes faster than dial-up. I doubt that this has improved significantly since the article was written. Uh, the economic and infrastructural challenges, I believe, just have not been sufficiently addressed to broaden, ban broaden uh, broadband access in these rural and sort of remote areas or impoverished areas where service is just not prioritized. So if you're serving lots of assets, high latency or low bandwidth can make your site functionally inaccessible to some. And thankfully, there is a technology uh, called Client Hints, which is supported in all Chromium-based browsers, which seems to be kind of creeping, <laughs> creeping out with uh, Edge switching over. Uh, but it is a, it's a nice technology, and it can definitely help us bridge the divide. What Client Hints do is they help developers to understand the characteristics of both a person's device 
and the network it is connected to. There are lots of client hints, but here are three that I feel are the most useful. The first is RTT, or round trip time, which is the approximate latency of a user's connection in milliseconds. Downlink is the approximate downstream bandwidth in kilobits per second. And the next is ECT, which stands for effective connection type, which is an enumerated string that categorizes the user's connection based on both the RTT and downlink hints. Now, these hints help us to tailor experiences so that we send less stuff to those on slow connections. We can opt into these hints with the accept CH HTTP request header, and we can tell how long, we can tell the client how long we want those hints to persist to the client with the accept CH lifetime header. And in the above example, the RTT, downlink, and ECT hints will persist on the client for a day. And then you can access these hints as request headers via a server-side language, which means you can access that information whether or not JavaScript is something that you can rely on. So here, for example, we initialize a variable with a default effective connection type of 4G. We do this for browsers that don't support client hints, for which we'll assume a fast connection by default. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it's, it's a bit of an assumption, but the idea is that if a browser doesn't support client hints, you, you send them the ideal experience. Um, but then we'll check to see if the ECT hint has been sent as a request header. And if it has, we overwrite that variable with that header's value. And with that information, we can create lighter experiences for those who need it most. For example, we can decide if a person will only see a carousel if they're on a fast connection. Otherwise, we'll compensate by sending them only what they really need. If somebody's on a very slow connection, they don't need a bunch of JavaScript and a bunch of images to slow everything down that's getting in the way of all that critical content. I like to call this adaptive performance. And it's a way to create experiences that are more inclusive by being aware of shifting network conditions. And it works. There are two versions of the same site right here. The version on the left has web fonts, a carousel, accordions, and JavaScript to run a bunch of it, which is functionally inaccessible on 2G, uh, taking about a minute and a half to load. But with client hints, we can boil this experience down uh, and adapt uh, to and, and create it like a core experience for people when they're on slow networks. And for our trouble, affected users will have something they can access more quickly than the ideal experience. As you can see here, uh, we can change this page's content and what it sends and its markup to reduce its payload several, several times over, and it will load in about five seconds on 2G. And if you want to learn more about client hints, uh, you can check out this guide I wrote for Google Web Fundamentals. I also did a, um, I did a sort of talk version of this article. Um, Estelle also helped to uh, proofread this guide and cut it for length, so you can thank her for making it more digestible. <laughs> um, the, the talk version might be more your style. That's, I did it at Full Stack Fest last year. So I'd like to close this talk on what I think is a very important point. Um, which is that we first need to figure out what it is that people want. Uh, when, like, what, what do they want to accomplish when they come to our website? What purpose are we trying to serve? And then we need to work backward from there and then build something which serves that purpose with care. Regardless of profession, craftspeople love their tools. And as developers, we're no different. We take pride in building great things with the tools that we have. But unlike, the, say, like the mechanic who fixes your car, the tools we use can have a direct and felt impact. When the mechanic fixes your car, he doesn't throw all of his tools in your trunk and you have to drive around with them. But when we, when we install like React and all of these things and we do, like we do all this stuff, unless we're really careful, that is a felt impact. People take on our conveniences, and we tend to assume that what is convenient for us is equally convenient for the user, and that may just not be the case. We don't need to burden people with the entire toolbox, or in some cases, um, the entire tool shed. And sometimes it makes more sense to use smaller tools which are more focused on the actual work. Your experience as a developer, yes, it is important, but it is never more important than the user's experience. If your excitement 
for a certain set of tools causes you to build things that no longer efficiently serve the purpose you set out to fulfill, it's high time you reevaluate them. And it's my hope that eventually, eventually, we together can all come to find our own ways of serving our collective purpose with utilitarian precision and for the benefit for all who use the web. Even, even if that means sometimes to get there, and this may be controversial, we don't always need JavaScript. Thank you. ahead of time. I could have bulked this up a little bit, but anyway, just more time for coffee. Um, <clears throat> so I'll take a few questions, and so what I would like to ask before we take questions is um, sometimes I have difficulty um, understanding uh, accents, and I apologize. Um, it's it's kind of hard for me, so it, if, I, if you ask a question, uh, please enunciate, um, and I apologize. I, I really apologize um, if, it's a, if it's an inconvenience. So I'll take any questions. Uh, thank you, oh. Jeremy. Yeah, just a, a few oh. words. If, uh, si vous voulez poser une question en français, uh, on peut s'occuper de la traduction. Uh, si vous préférez, vous êtes plus à l'aise. Oui. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question, uh, ab ab or about, uh, maybe more about your opinion. Uh, so, platform uh, has uh, most of the platform has web components. And uh, we don't have to ship React or another stuff, uh, but we can use uh, the uh, nativeness of the platforms so of web components and Shadow DOM and other stuff. What's your opinion about that? Uh, and have you experienced with this and uh, how it affects performance? Uh, specifically with uh, web, web components? Yeah. Or, so <laughs> web components, uh, to me, and I'll just, I'll just be, I'll admit, uh, because they're not settled, um, I've, I've kind of sidestepped them for the moment. Um, I know a cursory amount about web components, but my impression is that if, if they can be a widely supported technology, I think that they're, they, they're not going to be a replacement for React, but I feel that they're going to be something that we can, that we can put uh, things like React or Preact uh, to enhance them a little bit if we need to. And, and speaking very generally about um, native web technologies in general, if a native web technology has sufficient support, I feel that it's almost always a preferable alternative um, simply for the fact that you can reduce your overhead and you can, you can utilize something that ships with the browser directly without a layer of abstraction. And that's always going to lighten your experience. Now the cost of that sometimes comes in the developer experience because as you all well know, being a web developer, we tend to have to shim a lot of these things and like kind of make them work in places. Uh, I would like to see web components mature. Um, I, think they're, I think they're going to be very useful. Uh, but I definitely don't want to stand up here and, and pretend that I am a web components expert <laughs> by any means. So I, does that? Kind of cover? Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Awesome. Sorry for clearing my throat. A little dry. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Uh, what's your opinion on React? Uh, if I have a React app and I want uh, this snappy client side rendering, should I use server side rendering to get the faster loading, or I need to download React and then display everything so the page is already interactive? So. This is kind of funny. I, I have spent a lot of time. I use Preact, but it's basically the same thing in a smaller package um, with minus some features. But um, I, I've had varying and, and oftentimes strong opinions about, about React. But one thing that I cannot deny is that it has an excellent componentization model that is very useful and it helps you to organize your business concerns. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, however, and Speaking to what you just asked, uh, I feel that it should almost be mandatory that we render components on the server. Uh, from a performance standpoint, uh, if you can get HTML out, the, the critical content HTML out on the initial navigation request, uh, you are undoubtedly going to be rendering pages more quickly. That's just, it's a simple web performance fact. Because the, the 
waterfall for a um, for a client rendered like entirely client rendered app. Excuse me, is that you're going to have your your HTML request and that may fulfill relatively quickly because it's just HTML and it's probably just a bare minimum uh, to mount something to. But then you're going to have to rely on JavaScript and depending on how your your uh, bundler splits code or how you've configured it, if your bundler optimizations are suboptimal. Um, I feel like it's kind of courting trouble to rely entirely on the client to render something. And that's not just a performance concern, it's also an accessibility concern uh, oftentimes and can be an SEO concern somewhat. I, I actually inaccurately uh, stated that Google won't index uh, yeah. if something is, is client side rendered only. That's actually not true. Um, that's old thinking that I have to, that I yes. have to, yeah, I have to purge that. But yes, uh, if you can server render at any time that you can, and then if you have complex interactivity, like if you have a fully featured component that's not, like if it's not a stateless functional component, then mount that progressively to the client. Uh, you could use like an intersection observer to detect when that component is coming into the view and then you can execute that component logic and mount it as needed. Um, there's there's a few ways to do this. Um, I think Jason Miller wrote about this or Hussein Girde mm -hmm. uh, from Google wrote on web.dev about progressive hydration. That is worth checking out. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh. Uh. Thanks. Thank you for the talk again. Um, I'd like to hear about uh, what you think about WebAssembly, its impact on performance today, tomorrow. Would it replace JavaScript someday? WebAssembly is pretty cool, but like web components, it's something that I don't have a lot of experience with. But unlike web components, I've actually really tried to experiment with it. And um, I will just say that mscripting is really hard. <laughs> it's extremely difficult. So I haven't had a lot of luck with it. But the understanding basically what it is, I think that it's a difficult question to answer because I think it simply relies on your, on your application needs. Um, I think most needs on the web are going to be well served by the core technologies, um, the big three, HTML, CSS, and yes, sometimes some JavaScript. <laughs> um, so, I, but what I think WebAssembly is going to really shine is that when we, when we need to do resource intensive tasks that we've then delegated to like a remote server. Um, now, I know WebAssembly has more uses for it than this, but that's the one example I always think of is We've always like uploaded a large image to a client and then it has to process it and then pull, pull a response down. And that takes time and it's slow. And you know, when things are slow, users might drop off or they might forget that they're doing a task. I think what's cool about that is that you could, you could put an image optimization or processing binary as a part of your, as a part of your application and, and load it when you need it and then pro do that processing very quickly. Uh, but as far as like the broader uses, I would have to like look into it a bit more. Um, I think it's going to definitely shape uh, where the web is going in terms of interactivity, no doubt though. And did that, did that answer to your satisfaction? Almost. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, like like um, web components, I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert on web assembly. So um, I, I've got more time for questions. Got a guy right back there. Hello, Jeremy. Thanks. Um, you briefly talked about SEO. Uh, yes. You didn't talk at all during your talk uh, about the impact of JavaScript on SEO. Is it still a problem with JavaScript we have today, or is it not anymore? So, Chromium, uh, or not Chromium, um, Google Web Search is now powered by an, an evergreen version of Chrome. And so, if you can take advantage of platform features like differential serving, were you going to say something, Boris? Okay, I, you, you raised your microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Um, if you can take advantage of of things like that, I think then that can only help your SEO as Google takes those things into con into consideration. To what extent and what the weights are, uh, performance are on SEO, I don't think they've been crystal clear about that. Um, it can't hurt <laughs> for sure 
And that, that's just my thoughts on it. I know that's kind of a, a stub of an answer, so I apologize. Um, I can take one more, but if people just want five more minutes for coffee. Oh, right there. You've been watching intently. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for your talk. So if you serve two different versions, how do you test? How do you make sure that everything works? Do you have a good way of doing that? So I just went through this. At, um, I did uh, differential serving for Best Buy corporate uh, in America, and a lot of their components are now served this way. You, in order for this to really work, generally speaking, uh, differential serving should not cause you any issues because the way that the, that the, that the transpiler works um, is, is pretty good at ensuring that compatibility across those two different environments. Um, even if they're forked from one set of a, you know, from one entry point. But you definitely need to have a regression testing plan in place to ensure that things don't go wrong. Uh, there are edge cases. We had a component and we weren't even really sure what it was, but there was something in our differential serving logic uh, that that did cause an issue, and that caused us to have to refactor. Um, we, we had to delegate it to a team, but th there was a little bit of refactoring that had to happen in order to solve this. The, the answer is, I think the vast majority of the time, you're not going to experience regressions, but it is always good to have a regression testing plan in place to ensure that things don't break. But you can overcome them. It's, <laughs> it's not something where if it doesn't work, you're not going to be able to get around. Does that, okay, cool. <laughs> I, I always like to make sure I don't want to give a half measure, you know. Um, okay, well, coffee time, I guess, right? Cool.